Hello everyone. So, we finally get around to this map of Middle Earth. And I have to say, I think this has been the most intimidating topic so far. I've been lost in a sea of Wikipedia tabs that just didn't seem to end. There is so much history and information on uh, not just Middle Earth, but this entire world that Tolkien created. And we're going to have just a little bit of an exploration here of this part. But before we get into it, a quick note. This is a map I ordered from a small Etsy store. I will leave you the link in the description box. So see, it's a printed copy of an original illustration made by Andres Aguirre. And he also included this cute little bookmark of the Shire with Gandalf and Frodo standing in front of one of the cute little houses. So when we look at this map that we should consider up front. It says here, this is Middle Earth at the end of the Third Age. So we have an element of time. We're seeing this world at a very specific moment. If we're looking back or further ahead, the lay of the land might change. And two, we're also seeing that there is only a small part of the world that we see. The map is cut off here in the north, to the east. And in the south, when it comes to the continent of Middle Earth. And in the west, we have the Great Sea, but we can't see what's beyond. If we moved a little back in time to the Second Age, we might see the island of Numenor here in the east. Numenor is maybe inspired by the tale of Atlantis, a beautiful island that sank beneath the waves and during the third age was lost. The world that Middle-earth is part of is called Ea and the planet is called Arda, which might actually be our Earth. Tolkien did think that this whole story that he created in Middle-earth is fantasy, but he placed it in a fictional past of our own world. And maybe we live in the 6th or 7th age, some point in the future of Frodo and Gandalf. Outside of the realm, there is nothingness. And that is where Merkur was banished to. 
Merkur was one of the Valar, one of the first beings. They're kind of like gods or angels, and one of them, like Lucifer, fell. There was Melkor and his first lieutenant, Sauron, then became a force of evil in the world that we see here and a driving force between a lot of the stories we are familiar with. And these stories between good and evil go back quite far. If we start here, on this northwestern shore, we have Forlindor and Harlindon and the Blue Mountains. But in the first age, the land continued. This was part of the continent where the elves lived. And again, a part that sank below the sea and only Lindon, this part remained. That's where we also have the Grey Havens from which the elves depart to the west, to Valinor, a continent that is not part of our world anymore. The place that the story starts for most of us is here, in the Shire, which is in Eriador. Here in the north, you can see that this used to be a kingdom called Arnor, which you might see the ending, which is similar to Gondor. Arnor. These are two kingdoms of men. Gondor was founded by Isildur and his brother and Arno by their father, Elendil. But here at the end of the Third Age, Arno has faded and much of Eriador is wilderness. Some places are deserted entirely. The Westernmost part where men still live is here in Bree, which is one of the first stops for the hobbits as they leave the Shire. And it's also the only place where hobbits and men live together. The old forest, by the way, really is old. It is the last part of ancient forests that covered this part of Middle-earth. And where one of the maybe most beloved beings in this universe exists, Tom Bombadil, who unfortunately didn't make it into the movies. Bit of an enigmatic feature and one of the first that Tolkien created. So we go through the old forest to Bree, where they stop at the Prancing Pony Inn, and then they get here to the weather top, where you get the first impression that there was an older civilization here that left its ruins. 
and from there you get to Rivendell, home of Elrond, tucked here on, in on the slopes of the misty mountains, a mountain range that extends from the north down to Rohan the place where the fellowship of the ring is formed it's a beautiful place and was probably inspired by a valley in Switzerland Tolkien visited. But before we continue the journey here, or two journeys as the paths diverge, let's have a quick look north. There are the mountains of Angmar, with the old capital. Kandum. This is where the witch king of Angma resided and fought against the kingdom of Arnor. The witch king of Angma is the lord of the Nazgul. And it says that in Tolkien's work it isn't quite clear who the Switch King was, but he might have been a descendant of the Numenorians, so maybe related to the Lords of Arnor. Right, but we were in Rivendell. And if we follow one path across the misty mountains, we get here to Mirkwood, one of the largest forests, or maybe the largest forest here in Middle Earth. North. We have the Grey Mountains and through Mirkwood we get to the Lonely Mountain, Erebor, home of the Dragon Smaug in the tail of the Hobbit. And we also see here, there's the kingdom of Thranduil. These are the grey elves that speak Sindarin. Tolkien was a linguist, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard it said that he first invented languages and then kind of created this whole story of the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion to be able to place these languages in a fictional world. And so for the elves, he created two languages. Sindarin, which is spoken here, for example, and Quenya, which, for example, is spoken in Rivendell. He was very much influenced by Finnish, for example, which he thought was an incredibly beautiful language. But he was also very familiar with the history of English, and was inspired by Old English terms. But 
but we were here in Mirkwood and the name Mirkwood might give you an idea already that this is not a very light or welcoming place it's a dark place because of this part here Dorguldur in The Hobbit there's a figure called the Necromancer and this is actually Sauron who hid here before he returned to Baradur and Mordor Further out in to the west we find the Iron Hills the Sea of Rune but you can see that this part is not as filled in it's not as detailed compared to this area here of the Misty Mountains or the Shire So there are places in this world that we don't know about and I've seen someone describe it as the map being part of the world it's not a map about the world but it's part of the stories and you could imagine that this map was created by Bilbo or Frodo after their journeys when they put together what they learned about Middle-earth and some places they never got to explore they didn't have stories to tell so the map's not yet filled in Here north in the mountains of Angmar you can see that the river Anduin has its origin this great river that flows south and let's have a quick stop here in Lorien or Lothlorien This is where the Fellowship meets Galadriel the Wood Elves a beautiful almost unearthly place which fits with stories of Elves which say that they are not quite part of this world so Lorraine is tucked in here between the Anthering River on one side the Misty Mountains on the other and Fangon Forest in the south where the Ents are home, the shepherds of the trees but there's one part we've left out and that's Moria home of the dwarves you can see that one of the journeys from Rivendell continued south here to Moria there are paths across the mountains you can also take the path through under the misty mountains through the halls and mines of Moria but at the end of the third age these mines were deserted because the dwarves had dug too deep to find Mithril this famous metal 
against their thorough oryx and trolls and the Balrog. A little further south, here at the end of the mountain range, next to Fangorn, we have Isengard, where Saruman builds his tower, where he cuts down the trees and creates machines to create stronger and the better works, the Wukai. And a lot of Lord of the Rings, or this whole story that Tolkien invented, is of course inspired by the world that he lived in and the industrialization that he saw and what it did to nature and to the people that had to work in these factories, for example. And that might have been something that inspired this creation of Isengard. From there, we move a little further south and we get to Rohan. The mark of the horse lords. With Edras, where their great hall is located. And the southern border of Rohan is formed by the White Mountains. The Rohirrim were probably inspired by the Anglo-Saxons and we know that Tolkien studied Beowulf which is an old English poem and uh, I got a little sidetracked while preparing this video and ended up uh, ordering one of the newer translations of Beowulf and in Beowulf it tells us of a great hall where the Danes um, celebrated together and that great hall was probably the inspiration for the great hall of Edoas In the White Mountains, on the eastern side, we have Helm's Deep, where this great battle takes place. And if we move all the way to the eastern part, we come back to the river Anduin, flowing down towards the Great Sea, and we have Minas Tirith. This beautiful city of Gondor, the kingdom of men that was founded by Isidore and his brother, and Minas Tirith, has at its center a white tree, a sapling that was brought over from Numenor before it sank. I'm sure you remember the view of Minas Tirith, the white walls, the background of the mountains, and the seven rings with the gates, each level raised a little further to protect the center of the city.
Gondor too, at the end of the Third Age, has declined and doesn't rule over as much land anymore as before. The throne is empty. Isildur's heir, Aragorn, has not yet returned. The coast line here that we see was probably explored by the Numenorians and they built cities here. And then from Minas Tirith, if we cross the Anduin, we get to Osgiliath and then we have Mordor here with the Ash Mountains in the north and the Mountains of Shadows to the west and south We have Baradur and Mount Doom here, an active volcano Here it's called Urdruin but there's another name for it as well, which is Amon Amar, which you might know from a metal band and you might also be familiar with this name if you listen to similar music as I do, Gorgoroth, which is the name of the arid plain here. And by the way, Mordor, we have the syllable Mor here, which we've already encountered in Moria. And that means black or dark. This here is the corrupted land of Sauron and corruption or fall from grace in Tolkien's world is associated with darkness or blackness he also calls the language that's used in Mordor the black speech in Moria this Blackness refers to the darkness under the mountain Although this blackness really only came once the mines were deserted The reach of Mordor extends east and south, but we get to the end of the map here. And we don't really know what lies beyond. So we have Lindan here along the western coastline with the Grey Havens and the Blue Mountains we have Eriador with Shire Old Forest and Bree and the Old Kingdom of Men Arnor and the Realm of the Witch King all the way in the north There are the misty mountains from north to south and we find the realm of elves here in Birindel and Lothlorien and dwarfs in Moria We have the tower of Isengard and the forest of Fungal 
we have Uranio with Mercury, the forest of night, the grey mountains, Erebo and Tranduil's kingdom. We have Rohan in the south, the White Mountains, and Gondor, the other kingdom of men with Minas Tirith. And then Ash and Shadow Mountains surrounding Mordor. of Tolkien, that some of the magic is fading from this land. The elves leave to Valinor. The glory of Moria has passed. And the Numenorians, or the heirs there, the Dunadine, are losing their long life. The earth of talking is moving in our direction with this kind of magic, is one of stories that we tell, but not one we encounter anymore, as we set out into forests or mountains. But I think it's a good thing to keep these stories with us. They can be a wonderful escape from the world. Often they also help us make sense. Or, as is often the case, to find joy and new friends. And today I hope this little bit of story helped you find some nice dreams and good restful sleep. Thank you for watching and I will see you again soon. Good night.